Just to make sure I got this right verse. That old man, you see that? I had to go like that. What? There's a second verse. Did that say second? That was first Peter, right? And the inheritance that... Okay. Huh? Yeah, don't worry about it. I'm not worried about you judging me. <laughs> yeah, the Joseph May version. <laughs> You're guaranteed to go to heaven with this version. It's going to get you there. Oh, okay, there it is. I got it. All right. Oh, I'm about to knock this thing down, too. Okay. Don't lose the page. Oh. So, now we can pray. We should have prayed before that, because it struggles. All right. Lord, we come to right now thanking you for your love, your grace, and your mercy towards us. We thank you there is none like you. Uh, we just want to come to you and pray as we, uh, we read your word and, and go dive into your word, Father. You just teach us, encourage us, uh, and, and move us forward in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So as you know, I'm Joseph May. I am the president of the Tight Shirt Committee. Um, <laughs> sorry. I've been really wanting to say that for like three years, and I just have not found the place to do it. I just want to do it today. Uh, okay, so anyway, so we're going to talk about who is Jesus. Uh, that was the next thing we we're going to talk about, who is Jesus. So we're going to talk about it from a different standpoint, right? Uh, as you know, anytime there's a title of anything I'm going to talk about, we're probably not going to talk about the way you think. Um, and I like to drop uh, deep theology, you know what I mean? I like to drop that heavy stuff that when you leave here, you go, dang, you know, like it's just deep. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to walk through Jesus' last couple of hours on this place on, on earth. Uh, I'm going to take you through the night and, and take you all the way through the day to, to kind of explain who he is. And I'm going to use these verses uh, behind me to explain that to you. So is everybody ready for that? Okay, all right. So I want you to think about like this. Jesus uh, is, is at the Last Supper, right? He set everything up. He's ready for this moment. And Jesus himself is standing there, and he, he kind of gets up, and see, back in, those, back in the day, you didn't have chairs, right? So you didn't have chairs, so you kind of reclined and laid down, right? So that, that picture, you know, uh, John was in Jesus' bosom like that, that, that was like real stuff. You know, they, they just, that's how they did back then. They didn't have forks, they just used their hands. So Jesus is there, he, uh, Judas is there, and Judas is going to betray Jesus, he knows it, and he kind of alludes to it, tells him, somebody here is going to betray me, who is going to betray you? The one who dips this bread in the same thing I dip it in. Now, when Jesus dipped that nice piece of bread into this, this special sweet kind of, um, kind of, well, it's not sauce, it's like a jam, almost. That was actually Jesus offering forgiveness, right? That was a Jewish custom. Now, if you take it and you bit into it, you accept forgiveness. But if you don't, you're saying, I don't need your forgiveness, right? So Judas rejected that, and he left, and he went away. Jesus takes, um, he takes the bread, and he's got that bread, and he's looking at everybody, because no one really understands what's about to happen, and he says, this is my body, that is broken for you. Now listen, I don't know the last time you were at somebody's house and they took some bread and said, hey man, this is me being broken for you, right? It's kind of weird. And so they kind of look at Jesus like, what are you talking about? And then he tells them, listen, this is my, this, this wine. Now, it, back then you drank wine. The reason you did is because wine kind of purified the water. It's like us drinking bottled water now, okay? So Jesus has the wine. He says, and this wine is my blood, right? Now that was weird, that kind of caught everybody off guard. Jesus has talked like this before, but this time there's something different about how he's saying it. He's telling them, I'm going to be broken for you, and my blood is going to be shed for you. And they don't fully get it just yet. They don't understand what's going on. But he said, this, all I'm doing is for you. So they have this great moment. They even do a feet washing ceremony. Things are going, you know, they seem like things are going on the up, right? It seems like things are going great. And then Jesus says, listen, we need to go and pray for a while. So Jesus goes with now 11 disciples. So, so this is like the outside of, of, of the Garden of Gethsemane. So you have seven guys who stay back here. Jesus and his three closest ones, they come out to right here. So it's Peter, James, and John. They're right here. And Jesus goes off farther to pray. Now, the, the thing that's going through Jesus' mind is he's about to die. Right? He knows that. And he's suffering through this. It's so bad that he's sweating like blood on the ground because it's turmoil. Because we think of, you know, 
Jesus, you know, he's, he didn't want to die. The physical pain. But that's not what he was worried about. Jesus was going to be changed. Jesus was something's going to happen to him that he, that, you know, is not cool. Listen, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So that he might become the righteousness of God. He made Christ to be sin. This was a tough thing. Because guess what? God cannot fellowship with sin. God cannot be with that. And so that means there is going to be a broken fellowship at some point that Jesus is, does not want to have anything to do with. What if I told you tomorrow morning when you wake up, God's going to break fellowship with you. Are you ready for that? Imagine walking with God, being with God, being, he's God himself, and, and you've, you've been in heaven, you've heard the beautiful things, you, you know his truth, and you've walked this earth, and you've shared truth to everybody, you've always been with your father, and this is the first time that the fellowship is broken. Right? Without God, there is no hope. Uh, it, it, you, you ever remember when you were a little kid and you got lost in the dark? And you, you crying out for your mom and dad, don't you? Yeah. Right? Some of you probably did that now, you know, because it's dark out there, right? You're crying for your mom and dad, right? You're, you're saying, Mommy, Daddy, because it's dark and you feel abandoned. You feel alone and you're stretching in the darkness. Jesus is about to, to that's what he's about to endure. He's about to become sin, the one who knew no sin. Right? Now, listen. You know, we, we sing the, the cute Chris Tomlin song with it, don't we? He became sin, who knew no sin. And, and then Jesus, right? We, it's really, because he's got that nice high-pitched voice, right? Because I can't get there, right? We, we sing it with joy, right? But listen, that's, a, that's some deep theology. He became sin. He wasn't a, just a sin offering. He became sin. The very thing that God hates, he became. That's tough. The one who he says, I am pleased with. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. He said it again to, to James and Peter and John when they were on the mountain and he transformed in front of them like a transformer. He was like, oh, Optimus Prime on them. It was amazing, right? And so they looked at him. <clears throat> they looked at him and they said, it's good for us to be here. But they heard a voice and they, and they, hit, they fell to the ground and he said, listen, this is my son. Listen to him. The one that pleases God, the one that is only done with the Father's acts, is about to become sin, and he knew no sin. He's about to become the very thing that God hates, to the thing that represents rebellion against him. He is going to become that. In Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who's hanged on a tree. This curse isn't some fake Harry Potter stuff with a little spark on your forehead. The little, uh, in, anyway, I don't like Harry Potter, you can tell, right? And, but God is the one who's going to curse him. God is going to curse the one that he loves. The one that he's pleased with, God is going to curse him and put his wrath on him and he's going to be sin. That's heavy, you know. And then Romans 8, 3, for God has, for what God has done with the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. So not only that, listen, remember, condemnation is just punishment. God is going to put a just punishment on Christ, and he has never done anything wrong. This is literally who he is going to be for us. He became sin who knew no sin. Now we know sin. Not one of us in here has done something perfect and right. On our best Christian day, we feel like we are flying through the clouds. We are still falling short. But the one who knew no sin became sin. So he's in that garden realizing what's about to happen. 
He's just not going to be offering all the sins of the world. The, the, he becomes that right there for them. And so he's led away to a crazy trial where they lie on us. Somebody punches him in the face. He goes to another trial where the guy's like, dude, if you didn't do it, just say something. He's like, mm, it is as you say it is. And he drops a mic. And then he's like, okay, you know what? Fine. Just take him away. And how about we beat the guy? We'll beat him to a bloody pulp and then we'll show everybody and they'll have to let him go. They beat him and beat him and mock him. They take a, a crown made of thorns, force it on his head, and then force him to stand on his own in front of everybody and say, this should be enough for you guys. But it wasn't. They said crucify him. So they exchange a murderer for the righteous one and then they make him carry a cross until he can't carry it anymore. Right, listen, I, I don't know who's ever been beat down before, but if you get beat down, you just don't get up and go like, oh, I'm good. You ever play a sport and you just get, you just so tired you had to go to your knees? Now imagine playing that sport and you, you know, I can't breathe, and then we say, okay, I want you to carry this like this uh, 10 or, well, this 60 pound weight. I just want you to walk up a hill. He did all of that, and he's doing it willingly. It's not like they had to force him to do this. It's not like they held him down. He willingly gave up himself. So this is a suffering servant. He was crushed for us, bruised for us, beaten for us. And then as Isaiah 53, it just it says this was the Lord's good pleasure. This is our God and our King. And he's going to become sin. On the cross, as he's there, he's being nailed to the cross and he's just, he's, his hands are open. And, 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 and I can see why he said, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? I get it now. Because God had no choice but to break the fellowship and let his wrath come upon him. That, that's like your son who has done nothing and I willingly let him be beaten and I do nothing to stop it. When I see the pain that he's going through and I turn my back even to his screams and cries, let him be beat because he needs to become sin. He's not just the offering, he is sin itself, and I hate sin, and I will put my wrath upon him. <clears throat> now look, he's perfect though. John 8, 46, which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He was talking to the Pharisees, right? They couldn't convict him of sin because he's done nothing. This is the one who becomes sin, who, is, who knew no sin. I will no longer talk much with you for the rule of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. Listen, Satan accuses us because we have sinned, right? We've messed up. My past greets me too many times. It does it when I least expect it, when I'm sleeping. It, it, it does it if I go back to St. Louis and I go near my old college and you bump into that old oh, man. You remember me. You, rem you know what I look like. You know the things I've done. Please don't say anything. I'm, I got to move away to a small town. Nobody knows my name. Right? It, it, it haunts me, but he's done nothing. The devil can accuse Jesus of nothing. Because, listen, we, we think, well, Jesus could resist temptation because he was like Superman. Right? I got a Superman t-shirt on, by the way. It's just really cold. Um, right? We, we think he was like, he was, he was God in flesh. Yes, but listen, he was tempted and he never gave in. So you know what that means? The temptation level of Christ had to go higher and higher each time. Right? Hey, Satan, you're hungry. Make that bread. Mm -mm. No. No. I, I, I live on God's word. Not just by bread. Uh, took him to the top and showed him all the beauty and the glory of the world and all the kingdoms. I'll make you the ruler if you bow to me. No, I worship the Lord God only. I mean, he kept tempting. You, you know how hard that must have been? And then he lived 33 and a half years and he was tempted again. When Peter said, I'll never let anyone crucify you. He said, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. You're tempting me because you know I have to die and I have to be sinned. Listen, the torture was not the physical pain Jesus endured. 
It was the fact that he knew that his fellowship with God would have to be broken because God cannot fellowship with sin. And listen, when people ask me about hell, that's what it's like. No hope. Right now, I got hope. Things get glum, things get bad. I got hope because I got God. I've got Christ in me, the hope of glory. But if I don't have God, there is no hope for me. Not a shot in the world. And so he did this for me. He became sin who knew no sin. His righteousness is upon me because what he has done, he literally took his righteousness and took my sin and exchanged it. He took his, his tranquility and peace with God and gave it to me and took the wrath of God that was blocking me from receiving that. He made me righteous and he made me whole. And God is pleased with me because he is pleased with Jesus. And that's so relieving for me. This wonderful and beautiful Savior who saved my life willingly gave of himself. Right? Right? You're at peace with God. Do you know what that means? You have no fear of condemnation. You don't fear that God is going to strike you down and send you to hell. You don't have to worry about trying to get peace with the world, be popular so everybody can like you. You don't even need that because God's pleased with you. How popular do you have to be? You know, isn't it kind of weird, though, we try to get popular with people whose opinions don't matter? Is that just me? Does anybody else feel like that sometimes? Why am I trying to impress you who I'm not going to see in probably about two years ever again? Why am I trying? I'm going to work out every day to make you just, oh, you look cute. Thank you, boo. You know how I do. Am I, I'm, I'm doing that? <laughs> when the God of the universe is pleased because of his son and what his son has done, what he has done, it was his good will to, to put the weight of sin upon him and make him sin who knew no sin just so I can have fellowship with him that's unbroken for all eternity. And I'm worried about some girl. You're worried about some guy trying to look thin for somebody. Listen, if they, need, if they want you to lose weight, you, you know, I mean, I, I tell you what, tell them to Photoshop a picture of yourself. Okay? How about you lose weight? See, because, you know, I, I don't get this. I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to rant on this, but listen, young ladies. If some dude's telling you, oh, you too big, well, you know what? You don't need this then. You obviously don't want this, okay? This is beautiful. My God made this. Go find some other skinny girl then. Goodbye. I'm healthy and I eat. I'm t oh, boy. I, ooh, what? I feel sorry my kid's going to date. I'm going to just break some guy in half. <laughs> Sorry, ain't nothing wrong with that, trust me. When, well, she's too big. Well, my fist is really big, too. But here's the thing. You don't have to change who you are in Christ because Christ has made you beautiful. So why do we spend so much time trying to be something that we're not? Who are we trying to impress? Listen, in, in heaven, God's not saying, you know, Brett didn't like you. He wasn't impressed by anything that you did. I'm going to say, oh, Lord, I'm... So you're not going to heaven. I talked to Brett about it last night. Sorry. God's not going to do that. God is looking to see now are you seeking my will? Because listen, this is an exchange we made. He paid a debt that I could not pay. He made me righteous. Listen, the, uh, the Bible talks about, you know, you, you, the, you ever heard the term sin nature? You ever heard that? If you're good charismatic, you probably have, right? Or maybe if you're a Baptist. Anybody? Baptist? I love the Baptists, by the way. They're okay with me, all right? You just can't dance because that leads to crazy things. That's another joke. Some of you Baptists got that. <laughs> He's talking about, I'll tell you. After, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> That's charismatic. If I speak too fast, I'm just speaking in tongues. I'll give you interpretation later. All right. See, I got all kind of jokes. So every denomination, okay? I got, every, I got you covered. Don't worry about it. I got you covered. Don't worry about it. I'll get to you Methodist in a minute. All right. First, <laughs> second Peter, <laughs> second Peter chapter one. I love you guys. I do. I just, I had to do these things to stay focused. Second Peter chapter one, verse four says this, but which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. So through them, we have become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So listen, the sin nature, the whole idea idea behind that is when Adam and Eve sinned, and we all became under sin. And then we all have this tendency 
easy to sin. But listen, 1 Peter 2, excuse me, 2 Peter 1 verse 4 tells us we have a divine nature now. You know what that means? His divine nature, Christ's divine nature is now on me and in me. His Holy Spirit lives in me. Guess what I don't have to give in to anymore now? That sinful nature. I don't have to do it. I don't have to sell myself short anymore in sin. Anybody here besides me ever get bullied when you were a kid? Mm Mm-hmm. Right? I got bullied when I was a kid. I got bullied in middle school. I got, they tried to bully me in high school. Notice I said they tried. They tried to bully me in high school. And now, now listen, when I went back to my, you know, when I go back to St. Louis, I see some of these people. And the first thing, you know, it, it, they, hey, give me your lunch money. I'm sorry, there must be someone else behind me because you're talking to me, the army guy that can snap your neck? No, right? I, I know they're not. But here's the thing, I don't have to do what they ask me anymore. I don't have to do what they're trying to make me do anymore because I've grown. That's not me anymore. I don't have to be afraid anymore. And listen, when it comes to this sinful stuff, we don't have to do it anymore. Right? Because the struggle we have is realizing God has made us righteous with him. We're at peace with him. He's given us the divine nature, but we want to slide back in and flirt with the sinful nature. Let me tell you how you flirt with it, because what you're probably saying is, hey, listen, I am holy and I know Jesus. I don't give in to sin, okay? As a matter of fact, I should be holding you accountable. When we get finished talking, I'm going to talk to you, right? Listen, before you meet me out back, I'm going to explain this to you. Let me tell you how you flirt with it, okay? How many of you like music? How many of you like those beats? You, you just people better like music. I see you out here. How many of you like those beats, right? They, they're good, aren't they? How many of you like a good beat? And you just start, man, this is, this is the cut. And you start getting into it. Don't even know what you're dancing to, right? <laughs> hey, man, let's get in formation. Yeah, what's she talking about? I don't know, but I really want some real lobster, right? You have no clue what you're dancing to. And then you finally look at the lyrics. You go like, what am I dancing? No. My beautiful daughter loves, you know, we were with Chicago one time. We would listen to music, and it was, oh, the single ladies. And then she was, you know, she was doing it. I can't do it because I'm older now. But she was doing the dance, right? And, and I'm thinking, oh, that's cute for a second. But then, if you like it, you better put a ring. Oh, no, you don't. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Right? But the thing is, the song is so catchy, I find myself singing it. Right? And once you hear the, because you know the lyrics, right? Uh oh. And look at you. Some of you are, oh, oh, that's it, right? (laughs) I'm glad we're not taping this. Um, The point is, though, you start flirting with it, right? Look at your iTunes collection. Look at what you flirt with. Why am I struggling with lust? What are you listening to? Look at your movie collection. I'm going to tell you, I love Ben Stiller movies. Okay, there's not one I didn't cry at. I mean, I mean, I mean, ah, oh, that's a, you see, this guy is a fool. But you know, when I leave, I'm wondering why I'm thinking about the same thing. I look like a man who's a comedian named Kevin Hart. I get that sometimes when I take my glasses off and I, I get that from people, right? Sorry. I make fun of myself. It's okay. I make fun of myself all the time. But the thing is, when I'm listening to stuff that he's saying that is hilarious to me, because, man, I can kind of relate to that, it starts to get me to think about other things I probably shouldn't be thinking about. And I start to flirt with that. And I keep flirting with it. Listen, the wages of sin are not eternal life. They're death. But I keep flirting with it. When I was in high school, my dad made a a rule. Hey, listen, uh, keep the lights on when you're with a girl. And keep your hands to yourself. For what? For, you know what? You're just an old man. You don't know what you're talking about. Now, I took heed to that vice later on, thank God. I saw the people who did take heed to the vice and they got kids. Yeah, I know. It's, got, it's, it's not funny, but it is kind of funny. But the whole point I'm making is this. You flirt with it and guess what happens? Guess what it leads to? And then you find yourself, because have you ever found yourself in a sin and you wonder, how did I get here? How did I get in this mess? 
I don't even like watching this stuff, but I can't stop watching it. And I got to watch something that's more degrading every time. I'm watching this crazy stuff, and now I'm in the stuff that I've never thought I would be in ever in my life. And now I have issues. Because we're flirting with it. We're not realizing that Christ is the righteousness of God and he's made us righteous. Christ has put us at peace with God, so we're at peace with God. But we keep flirting with death. We keep flirting with sin as if this is better, as if it is more. We don't pay attention to our red flags. If you're tired, hungry, angry, or lonely, guess what you're more prone to do? Make a poor decision in sin. You think that you don't realize, I don't know if you guys realize, especially you males, do you know why TV is geared towards you? Right? Because listen, if I watch a soap opera, you don't see nothing. You just hear this horrible romantic story about a guy who's been working out every day, but he has not used the restroom once in this series, and he just comes in and saves the day. He's everything this woman needs. Right? So you don't watch a soap opera because it's boring. Right? I used to watch One Light to Live with my mom when I was growing up in General Hospital. Luke and Laura, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Right? Now, but what I noticed as I got older, TV was geared towards me as the day went on. As the night began to, to rise and the sun began to set, the TV would, would start to change. The clothing got tighter. The woman got skinnier. Their parts got shown more. And then it just goes worse and worse. And then the hope is that you stayed up and watched Cinemax tonight and see everything else. Or maybe they want to encourage you to go to a, a website that has various pictures that you don't need to see. Right? What are they trying to do? They're trying to get you to just go all into it, but they got to start somewhere. So you start in the morning. You know how porn makes most of his money? It's not by what you watch. It's what they can get you to think about over and over and over and over and over. And then leads you right back to it. And then you say, I'm not going to do this again. But they get you to think about it over and over and over. And leads you right back to it. Because we're flirting with it all the time. But this is what I find out. Why am I flirting with this when I'm loved by God? Now, I'm not asking you to do better. I think that's the worst thing you tell a Christian. Do better. Stop this and do better. I'm asking you to love God. I'm asking you to love Him more than this flirtatious thing that you have. I'm asking you, if, if you're in a relationship and they love you more than they love God, you need to get out of that relationship. It's not worth it. But He loved me. Baby, He don't. I'm going to be honest with you. Especially the young ladies, too, because if I meet your boyfriend, I might put a hole in his chest with my fist. If he's talking about, well, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm a religious man. I know about the guy upstairs. Dude, sit down. Can, you, can we let the real man come forward, please? I'm not going to punch anybody, okay, because I'm a peaceful, loving guy. Um, <laughs> just making the point. Listen, you need to find someone that loves Jesus more than you. Better yet, let me skip that. Ladies, you, you let the man who loves Jesus more than you find you. You don't have to be desperate you don't have to jump at the first available person. Okay, don't. Because they're looking for that. You wait. You are Cinderella. You let that prince come with the glass shoe and say, it's you, boo. It's you. I want, what, you, what I got to do to be with you? Because I love my Jesus. I love him. And I love you. Listen, when I met my wife, all bets were off. I didn't want to talk to anybody else. Hey, you look cute. I don't care. I'm ugly to you. Hey, baby girl, what's your name? My name is Joseph. They call me Chocolate Drop, baby. <laughs> I'm glad my wife wasn't here for that last part. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to wrap this up because I don't know what time it is. Does anybody know what time it is? 9.42. Thank you. Uh, what time did I start? Mm, okay, we're going to wrap this up. Thank you. So here's the point I want to get to you guys to make very clear. I know we're talking about who Jesus is. Listen, he's the righteousness of God. He's at peace with God and he has made us that. So now we know who Jesus is. That means we must understand who we are in him and stop flirting with the things that are going to lead us to sin and destruction because it's not worth it. A relationship is not worth it. More sin and doing the crazy stuff, looking at crazy stuff on computers, talking about people, living a lifestyle totally objective to what God has called is not worth it. Because listen, when you weigh it on the scale, death and hell, life and heaven in Christ Jesus forevermore. He wins. I want you to understand that to get you where you got right now, he had to become sin. Let that weigh on you. That's heavy theology. If someone's trying to get you to compromise your walk, 
Don't compromise for him. He's done more than enough. I don't care if they put a ring on your finger yet. If they're not willing to walk with him, they ain't worth it. And if they don't want to hear that, I will tell them myself for you. It's not worth it. Don't compromise. Because he became sin who knew no sin so I could be with him. So why am I selling him for something that doesn't even like me? Only wants to see my end and destruction. Why settle? I'm not going to have the thing. It's, it's not about what is, is better. It's about what's best. And he's best for me. He's best for you. And he did this for you and me. The guy who can't stand to look at himself when he sins, or even talk about it, or even want to be around people, he's still pleased with me. The guy who struggled with depression a little bit in college and thought about killing himself, he did this for me. And he did it for you. Don't settle. It's not that God's got something better around the corner. You got a better man. No, God says, I'm best. I am best. And I'm going to take care of you, my child, because I am best for you. And I know what's best for you. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you there is none like you. God, I just pray that you would help us to see that you, Jesus, are the righteousness of God. You are at peace with God and you have made us righteous and, and put us in a place of peace with God. Help us, Lord, not to settle. Help us to recognize when we're tempted to sin. Help us to see the little things that are, are just speaking to us. Help us to see through the lies, Lord, and help us to see you. Help us to walk away from things, Lord, that are only going to cause us to sin and live in sin. Help us to cut those things off because we don't have to obey that sinful nature anymore. Because we have a divine nature in you because of what you have done. And by your Holy Spirit, you've empowered us to live in that nature, God. Help us to walk out our faith with fear and trembling as you bring us through this process, Lord, of, of sanctification, Lord, by taking us through these tough moments in our life, by pulling us away from a sinful way and, 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 and just leading us into this glorious beauty with who is you, God. We thank you that you love your bride and we thank you that you are pleased with her. Now help us to find, Lord, that when you are most glorified, we are most satisfied. And we pray these things. And for any plans that any have, we just say, the Lord rebuke you. And get behind us, Satan, for you're not having my things of God, but the things of man. In Jesus' name, we all said.